So on behalf of uh, IEEE Bangalore section and on my own behalf, I would like to welcome formally Sankteep Mitra. So Sankteep Mitra, I, I am having your brief bio, so I would like to go through that so that attendees, those who are attending, they will be knowing much more about you and then we can start the presentation. So I hope it is okay. That sounds great. Tony. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. So dear friends, Sangdeep Mitra is a passionate enablement and learning advocate who specializes in a technical workforce development and product adoption. He leverages his background in engineering, instructional design, digital learning, and tech enablement to build and evangelize learning experiences that are engaging, relevant, scalable, and accessible. Sangdeep 12 years of experience in the industry and has worked across organizations including Adobe Systems, Akamai Technologies and Infosys. He is currently leading the technical enablement and learning practice at Walmart Labs, India, where his team creates and supports programs for onboarding and continuous upskilling of its associates across a broad variety of roles such as software engineering, product management, program management, and data science. Born and raised in Bengaluru, Sangdeep is an old world Bangalorean at heart, who is also appreciative of his roots in Kolkata. He best describes himself as hailing from South Bengal. Oh, very nice. He is married to Vibha, and they have two-year-old son, Adwik, who is the subject of much of their love and attention. So, Sangdeep, we are very, very fortunate to have you on board with us and uh, floor is open to you. Thank you very much, uh, Puneet, for that uh, warm introduction. My uh, formal gratitude and thanks to you as uh, chair of the IEEE Bangalore section, as well as to uh, Tengappa, who's been most supportive as co-chair of the professional activities for IEEE Bangalore section. I think uh, Puneet's uh, uh, given a very warm introduction about me, so I will not spend much more time on myself. Briefly, just want to highlight my organization, Walmart Labs India. Uh, as many of you know, Walmart itself is one the world's number one retail and a Fortune One company with over five hundred billion dollars of revenue in fiscal year twenty twenty. And our organization here in uh, India, Walmart Labs actually has about 4,000 associates across a variety of tech roles, including engineering, product, program management, data, and other enabling functions. And we look ourselves as the technology solutions provider that powers the future of retail for Walmart. So like, like many of you over here, we have very passionate technology enthusiasts at Walmart as well. And we love to evangelize about the work we do and the innovative technology solutions we provide and share our thoughts on uh, the domain and the industry in general. So once again, I, I welcome all of you and thank you all for taking the time out. Uh, given the multitude of uh, challenges and predicaments we face today, uh, the, the fact that you're all here today just to spend this time together, I think I'm most appreciative of. And I hope that there are some uh, strong takeaways for all of you with respect to how you think about your own technical learning and development journey and how we can look at it through the eyes of our society, which I think is in much need right now, given the current pandemic. So for today, I have divided my presentation into three sections, which I want to talk us through. Uh, we begin by taking a look at uh, innovation in the context of social adversity, both past and present. And we will then segue into what is the secret behind the motivation that drives our own individual activities and our learning and development. In the final section, I will be sharing some tips and tricks and techniques that can help each of us craft our own learning journey. And I hope that we can bring it all together at the end with some key takeaways that you can all apply. And I, I look forward to this session being practical. I look forward to receiving questions and being able to take questions at the end of the session. But uh, with that said, I will dive in into the very first 
section of my presentation which talks about innovation in times of social adversity. So I think at heart, given that we all have this very famous quote called necessity is the mother of invention, I think it's fair to say that um, as a species, we are all inventors at heart, right? And, and the fact is that before we can actually look to invent anything and we can look to innovate, I think we have to spend some time participating, participating in the world around us, listening, learning, hearing, understanding. The, the question therefore is how? You know, we are all leading such busy lives, uh, split between our family commitments, our work commitments. How is it that we can actually spend some time to actually participate and learn? It's often said that the, the best way to you know, begin a journey is to seek inspiration. So to that effect, I always look to be inspired. I look to be inspired by path breakers in their own rights. And uh, one such person who I think has been a uh, has been a profound inspiration on, on certainly my outlook towards education and my outlook towards uh, society and development is uh, uh, Shonjit Roy, who is more commonly and affectionately referred to as Bunker Roy. Um, for, for those of you who have uh, perhaps not as familiar with his body of work, I think what I'd briefly say about Shonjit is, uh, Shonjit Roy is that he's the founder of Barefoot College, which was instituted in the year 1972 in a place called uh, Thelonia in Rajasthan. And the salient characteristic about his college that he had set up was that it was primarily built for the poor and by the poor. I think in his 2011 TED talk that he delivered, he very uh, joviously mentioned that if you had a PhD, it is perhaps the first college in the world where this would not perhaps be the right fit for you. Instead, he looked at people who were cop-outs, washouts in society, who were actually in a position to teach others. So there was none with a professional qualification, but uh, many who had a aspiration and a uh, commitment to want to do something for the community that they were living in. Uh, some of the words from his, uh, you know, talk that I think stuck with me and resonated with me, you know, that, which I've articulated here on the screen, where he says that. You don't have to look for solutions outside. Most solutions are actually within and which involve having conversations and listening with people on the ground. And that's where you will actually find all the solutions in the world. So I think the, the takeaway from, for me, you know, from the work that uh, Mr. Sanjeev Roy has done is think of grassroots. You know, it's very nice to have um, a lot of vision and strategy that is uh, uh, that is a bit profound and at a bit of a high level, but but sometimes the 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 art of actually solving for challenges begins with listening to people on the ground, and I think that that has been you know one of my takeaways certainly in terms of my methodology and outlook, and I hope that that's something that uh, resonates with many of you as well. Now, we live in very unprecedented times. I'm sure that this uh, has been said often, and all of you have thought about this as well in your own minds as you think about what the future of your everyday day-to-day -day interaction and your work looks like. So if you think about our community as a whole, split across our urban and rural divides, the, the fact remains that we have very similar challenges. We have challenges in terms of our health and well-being, in terms of our access to education, our uh, re-envisioning and imagining of how we work and where we work and how we interact in that work. Um, what does the future of our plans look like in terms of our financial well-being, our ability to have financial transactions with each other? I'm sure that many of us uh, at the start of the pandemic were uh, furiously uh, looking at our Big Basket app or Grofers app, like you know, in the old days, people would look at lotteries wondering you know how soon is that colgate toothpaste going to run out and how soon can i place an order so our supply chains as a whole are significantly impacted and that is something that i think is something to think about as well in the context of our future community finally mobility you know we have all we have talked heavily about shared mobility public transport but 
are we inching our way into a future where our idea of mobility is going to be different and what impact does it finally have on the environment you know many people posted uh, very encouraging photos uh, in the recent past about uh, clear skies but but honestly should it really take a pandemic to uh, result in a healthier and cleaner environment or is there a more sustainable way for us to actually achieve all of this so these are i think immense challenges that lie ahead of us as a community you know as we look to really imagine the future of our community and and none of these can be achieved you know if we do not learn more about these various aspects and how can we find ways to apply our knowledge and skills to be able to solve for these incredible challenges that we have at hand they are certainly doable i think we as a society are a resilient and a very intelligent society and i'm sure we find our way forward my my i think my message here is that we all look at each of us as uh, enablers towards actually achieving that goal in our own little way how can we contribute through our knowledge how can we gather additional skills and how can we actually influence the community around us to be able to accomplish or at least move forward on some of these challenges that i have highlighted one such interesting case study that i wanted to briefly talk about was this uh, tech non profit called dost dost education a very interesting body of work that they do so in the pre covid times what dost's uh, program was about was the fact that they would provide daily phone calls to parents who were primarily i would say from uh, marginalized and underprivileged sections of society uh, themselves quite limited in their education but and therefore to some extent unable to influence the quality of the education and the quality of the learning activities that they wanted for their children you know more often than not as old parenting adages go the the thought process was that rote memorization is a is the only way to learn you know and i think as we all recognize that uh, rote memorization by itself does not really work on the ground ground level when you actually transition your way into practical work and application so this this uh, tech non profit through their one minute phone calls it only required a parent to actually uh, give a missed call to a particular number and that was as good as signing up for the program they would receive these daily one minute phone calls which detailed learning activities that helped kids in uh, you know primary education to uh, actually have continued learning now i think with the advent of covid obviously schools have closed down and uh, parents and lively and their livelihoods have been significantly impacted so you can already see that a tech non profit has pivoted its uh, offering to to support some of the needs of our times uh, especially parents like uh, these who are the primary recipients of the program uh coming from marginalized sections of society with uh, access to their livelihoods deeply impacted it's quite uh, encouraging to see that they have included talks about how to manage stress how to encourage positive behaviors for their families and to improve their hygiene practices so very much in tune with the times and i think that this reflects in itself uh an inherent agility which i think is a critical skill for all of us uh, many of our companies are uh, i would argue to some extent our goals our visions for for the year our plans and road maps have have been impacted right as a result of the challenges that we have ahead of us the very nature of our interaction i have been working from home for quite some time and i think most it organizations have been doing the same thing i'm sure there are in, uh, companies in other industries who are also uh, pivoting to similar ways of working so this continues to be something that we need to work our way through how can we better serve our own customers our colleagues how can we find new and intelligent ways to work together that can help us meet the needs of this future head on with now move on to talking about the secret of motivation we have just taken a look at some examples about how we find uh, uh, 
ways to contribute back to society. Of course, not all of us may have the ability to uh, completely start off organizations or enterprises dedicated to the cause of society. But the beauty, I think, is in the fact that many of these uh, nonprofits and tech nonprofits do have volunteer programs that you could leverage to actually be able to contribute in a limited time within the availability that works best for you. But, but see, in order to really be able to contribute back there, the underlying uh, thing that has to drive all of us is, of course, our motivation. Now, to many, I think motivation is a bit of an abstract uh, science. You know, how do you really quantify motivation? How do you really put in some boundaries and guardrails around motivation to really understand the concept? Uh, this infographic that I have uh, put on our slide here is actually the national hierarchy of needs. To, to those of you who are not familiar with this uh, concept, it basically articulates five different levels at which we as a human species really operates in terms of our physiological uh, constitution, right? So at the most base and carnal level, you would argue that our fundamental needs as a, as a species as a, is, is to have access to air, food, water, shelter, clothing, and so on. And uh, as you go up this tier, you find that your needs are also upgrading. You next move on to your needs around safety. You know, how do I ensure that I have security for myself? How do I ensure that I have uh, a source of employment that puts food on my table? How do I have access to sufficient resources for my well-being? And am I able to take care of myself? And uh, after that, you graduate to being able to build relationships where you start having friendships, you have uh, loved ones, you have your family, you develop a sense of connection. And to some extent, this is true of what we do at our workplace as well. And um, many of you may be able to uh, resonate when I say that when we join new workplaces, we join new organizations and we look to be our best in those organizations. One of the first things that we all look to achieve in our new workplace is a sense of belonging. We want to become part of a team. And as a team, we look to take on new challenges. And within the scope of those challenges, we have a defined body of work where we contribute and we take ownership and accountability. And therein lies our individual success and of course our collective success as a team as we march towards our organizations ultimate vision and goal. So from there, it's it's fair to say that we derive a huge sense of self-esteem. That's where we derive our respect. We, we look at our status in society. We look at the recognition we receive. We look at our position as a source of strength. We look at our freedom at, at, at what we do as a way to really elevate ourselves. But somewhere, as you try to now bridge the gap between the esteem and the self-actualization phase, you realize that there are a bunch of challenges. Now, what are some of these challenges that uh, take place? This is what I describe as the motivational pitfall. What happens is when we get used to the idea of deriving a huge sense of recognition solely through our accomplishments at work, what we don't recognize is that our work is also a single space that we inhabit among a multitude of spaces. So whatever we do at work, typically in most in many scenarios, remains at the workplace. And you may have some new ideas that you would like to see materialize, that you would like to experiment with. Circumstances at every work organization are not always conducive at every point of time. And uh, we do believe that every organization has a certain time and space in which it looks to encourage new ideas and thoughts. But there will always be times when the circumstances are not always easy to control or influence. And as a result, when you find yourself unable to apply all your new ideas, a sense of discouragement or frustration may creep in. This is but natural, given that as an organization, there will always be shared goals. So, every aspect of an individual's 
aspiration may not be possible or realistic to achieve. But in that respect, given that uh, most studies indicate that about 25 to 30 percent of our life is spent at the workplace, the question here therefore arises that shouldn't we find other spaces which we inhabit for the majority of our existence to channel our ideas and thoughts into? So the question is how to broaden our focus? Do we recognize what those what the other 75 percent of those multitude of spaces actually look like? I want to introduce this concept which uh, is called Ikigai, uh, a Japanese concept which stands for a reason for being or in other in a synonymous way you could call it it helps you define your sense of purpose. See over here, what you can be paid for intersection with what you are good at is typically where our profession lies. And what I was just alluding to in the previous slide is that if we spent our entire lives assuming that the only way we would derive fulfillment and a channel for all our ideas is going to be through this intersection, then fundamentally missing out on a multitude of other spaces where we have an opportunity to exercise those same practices and skills. So as you can see, I think this concept is very uh, elegant yet profound in what it's trying to convey. Never have I been so inspired by a Venn diagram. And I did not believe when I studied Venn diagram in mathematics that it would one day lead to such profound realizations. But I think that's the beauty of mathematics and that's the beauty of uh, you know, visualization when you look, when you apply it as a philosophy towards our lives. And so my message and uh, simple uh, idea that I'd like to share with all of you is that uh, look to inhabit all of your spaces between what we are good at, what we have to do, uh, what we believe our world around us needs and, and what we can get paid for. Uh, as this infographic indicates, Therein lies our ikigai, the ability to find this intersection. Yeah, I think it's a it's a very really, uh, elegant infographic to see on the screen. But I think as we all start thinking about, you know, do we recognize what each of those areas mean for us individually? I think the exercise becomes just a little bit harder, and I think many people will end up spending months and years together really find their ikigai. But the hope is that we all do find it because I think that is where then our reason for existence becomes clear and we find negative you know, uh, emotions such as frustration and uh, disappointment being sidelined in favor of a broader sense of purpose where even failure is therefore accepted as a stepping stone to the next big thing that we'd like to achieve. So what we saw, I think from the concept that I highlighted in the previous slides is that if you think about the effects, the benefits of our motivation as it spurs us into our own well-being as well as the well-being of others, I think we could agree that when we find a sense of purpose that helps us elevate the lives of those around us, we find ourselves less susceptible or vulnerable to negative emotions such as and negative and the outcomes of those negative emotions. We will find that we have increased our own happiness and our ability to cope with stress. I think stress, many of us would agree, is, is but a response to a scenario that we are presented with. By itself, it is not an emotion that is spurred off in, the, in, in, in our body or in our minds, but really it is our reactions. So the question is that, you know, if we, if we, if we for a moment think of not just ourselves, but but of everyone around us and we think about where we stand in the grand scheme of things in this universe is it possible for us to perhaps realize that maybe there is maybe we are just hyper inflating our own sense of self so if we were to just dial that down a couple of notches we may find that we are better able to cope with stress listening is a is a key part of that exercise because i think when whenever we get too absorbed by our own selves it's important to spend time interacting with others just to understand their own uh, areas of uh, discomfort that they're facing or challenges that they're having and just to lend a ear 
to see if there's something we can do. And if not, anything is at least just send the patient here. So I think with, with the ability to actually give back through our motivation and our sense of social purpose, we will find that we have improved our ability to interact with others and we'll improve our empathy towards others, which ultimately leads us in a position when we can actually have better problem solving. So how do you start? I think we have, we have looked at uh, you know what are the different uh, channels for how you can motivate yourself. How can you recognize the source of your motivation? We certainly talked about uh, tech nonprofits and other examples in, in one of the sections previously. So my suggestion is that if you are part of an organization today, I'm sure that most your organization will have a corporate social responsibility chapter or program wherein it partners with several nonprofits or other tech nonprofits in pursuit of some common programs. So it is worthwhile for you to see if you can research and uh, identify which of your organization's CSR programs work best for you so that you're actually able to apply yourself and participate over there. Um, in a previous organization, I did spend time actually uh, teaching back to children who were from, uh, uh, I would say, um, marginalized sections of society where we actually spent time giving them English classes, teaching them how to read, write, and communicate better in English. And it was a very fulfilling activity, I would say, at the time. So you will definitely find such uh, opportunities and avenues through your own organization CSR program. So if you're part of a, if one of such an organization that does have one, please, I would encourage. It, it doesn't take a lot of effort. The hourly commitments are quite small. So if you are able to, please do take the time to uh, participate and uh, offer volunteer your services. Specifically around uh, the current pandemic, uh, there is a very interesting resource available on which is called the Coronavirus Tech Handbook, which while the name is tech, it actually does have a broad variety of uh, uh, resources in that handbook. It's a shared handbook that is maintained by uh, a volunteer group of librarians from across the world. And it talks about how developers, uh, entrepreneurs, social activists, NGOs, and others can contribute and work together towards enabling access to more and more resources and uh, specific work groups that are solving for challenges around the present pandemic. Finally, it's never been easier to sign up for meetup groups that are of your specific areas of interest or to volunteer for tech nonprofits who are always on the lookout for additional hands to help them in their mission. Some of these nonprofits provide uh, commitments as low as one hour per week. So if that is a period of availability that works for many of you, then my, my suggestion certainly is that do research some of the tech nonprofits that are currently operating here in India. And you can also look at Meetup as a way to find a relevant Meetup group that works for you. Just a small call out in this regard to ensure that you do not uh, find yourself running afoul of any uh, uh, specific regulations. If you're part of an organization, then do review your any opportunity that you identify with your company's legal ethics and compliance team before you actually go ahead and confirm your participation in any of these activities. So we move on to the section where I talk about how we can now craft our own learning journey. At the, at the beginning of this presentation where I talk about the fact that the, that the future of our community depends on focus in several areas. So for us to actually be able to solve the problems associated with any of those areas, and even otherwise, I think we are always on a lifelong learning journey. So, so then becomes that if one were to actually craft a learning journey for themselves, what would that process or what would the components of that learning journey look like? Over the years that I've been crafting learning strategies and uh, working on executing several learning strategies for 
many of my organ many of the organizations that i have been fortunate to be a part of what i have found is that there are five key components to being able to craft a structured and uh, effective learning journey the first of which is a clear personal with mission and vision which is then followed by a uh, a framework that i call the north star framework it's important that when we identify what our north star is we also spend some time especially struggle to have a honest evaluation of our personal strengths and weaknesses we we need to spend the time to actually do that exercise so that we recognize what our individual strengths are uh um, what are the areas that we can improve in what are the opportunities ahead of us and what are some of the things that are happening around us that may actually make us more vulnerable and exposed depending on our weaknesses and i think once you have these first three in place the four activity very much akin to us defining our uh modern time tables so to speak where we identify progressive learning goals and my my call out here with respect to those learning goals obviously is that with each learning goal as it occurs over a period of time that that learning goal become more increasingly complex in the nature of the information the knowledge and the skills that you are looking to practice from that are and that you look at those learning goals as having an impact not just upon your own self and your immediate workplace perhaps but how can you actually broaden the impact of your learning through increased social reach lastly all of this you know while it's excellent as a concept and it's excellent to execute more often than not we can sit back and rest on the laurels we received by just having delivered a solution but a but a significant part of understanding if that solution was effective on the ground or not was to actually measure the the impact of that solution and to receive feedback from the people who were directly impacted by that solution so that we get an honest assessment of how effective our solutions were and how could we iterate upon that when we set out to achieve our next goal so i'll spend a little bit of time now talking about these sections let's begin by talking about our mission and vision um we see that every organization does have its mission and vision clearly defined my call out here however is that we must have one of our own because at the end of the day we as individuals certainly identifying our own sense of purpose must have a reason for for why we do what we do and what is our aspiration for what we want to do tomorrow so if you are trying to articulate such a statement for yourself today uh, i hope that you know the some of the information on this slide helps you in terms of being able to identify how you could go about articulating that statement but very simply put the important questions that you should be looking to answer in your personal mission and vision are what you do why you do it who are you and how do you go about actually doing it the difference therefore between the two comes in terms of the time frame in which you are looking at it the mission statement resonates primarily around your current knowledge skills and your opportunity to apply and embrace change today whereas your vision statement is more aspirational should take into consideration the increased knowledge and skills that you will look to attain by the time that this vision has to come true and you will look at it as a as a future road map for yourself in terms of how it changes what you do why you do who do you do it for and how do you do it so when it comes to thinking about how the principles that go into transitioning you from your mission statement to your vision statement i would say let's begin by identifying our gaps we will never i think reach a point when we have learned everything we want to learn about every aspect of our lives that impacts us 
I think that would be practically impossible, which is why we we often focus and call out the adage of continuous learning and being lifelong learners. So it's good to identify what those gaps are and how can you find ways to upskill and reskill against those gaps. And while this is a personal mission and vision statement by itself, the, the fact remains that the, the best way in which you can actually realize these statements is when you are more inclusive, which means taking into consideration the impact of what you look to do on those around you. So who are those? Who are those potential people who you will impact to your mission and vision? It's good to include your conversation just so that it helps to articulate a realistic mission and vision statement. So the underlying theme therefore there is that not only grow yourself, but grow others too. With your knowledge and skills over time, you will find yourself in a position where you are able to evangelize more and that becomes crucial to share and disseminate what you know with others so that they can jumpstart their own learning journeys. And ultimately at the end of the day, when we step back from a system that we have been able to craft or put together, can that system stay self-organized? Is the balance delicate enough yet sustained enough that should, you should find yourself that you're able to move on to the next thing that you want to do and the thing that you set up and the players who work in it are all able to manage and keep themselves organized and sustainable. Now let's talk about the North Star framework. The North Star framework is where I, I suggest that it puts in place a brief a diagram, a diagrammatic representation of the gap between where you are today and where you want to be. So just like our ancestors in the good old days uh, looked at the skies above and studied the constellations to identify their navigation and path forward, similarly, a metaphorical North Star lies with each one of us. And for us to work our way towards that North Star means that we identify time-bound milestones. And within those milestones, we apply two axes of references. On one axis, plot the actions that you would like to practice. On another, you could try plotting your behaviors that you would like to practice. And what you will find at the intersection of both are the outcomes that you would achieve. To, to quote a practical example from a uh, body of work, let's say that you are part of a team that is uh, quite chaotic at the moment. You were not really sure who is working on what and uh, how much work is on each person's plate. You need to find a predictable way to be able to get a good visibility of who's working on everything so that you have equitable work distribution across your team. So the actions that you will perhaps- I'll see you. I'm sorry. As, uh, I assumed I was briefly, uh, there was a question there, but I'm just going to move forward. So what I was saying is that you could look at an action being as simple as setting up a project workflow tool. You know, so many of you may be familiar with uh, tools such as Jira or MS Project or MS Excel, for instance. So the action could be as tactical as setting up a project management tool, whereas your behavior could be practicing accountability and transparency. Each member of your team is actually honest and transparent about what they are working on. So the intersection of the two then represents the outcome where when everybody is able to plot their act activities that they are working on, as a whole, collectively, you all have equal visibility of who's working on what through that tool. So that's an outcome. So that's just a very small tactical example. You can certainly uh, elevate it as high as you would like, and you can be as tactical as you want. But I just wanted to introduce one practical element over there just to help you understand how this framework can be applied in practice. And sometimes when you find that it is uh, still difficult, because it can be quite challenging to draft this 
North Star framework where you identify each of those time bound outcomes at the intersection of the two. So if you would like to have a more honest assessment of where you currently stand, this tool, which is called a SWOT tool, is can be quite beneficial. What I would uh, encourage you to do is very self-explanatory, as you can see on the slide, but basically create a two by two grid for yourself where you identify your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and the threats. And while the threat word may have a slightly negative connotation, look at it more in terms of what are some of the things happening around you that could impact you in a negative way by limiting your ability to be as productive as you are today. So if you are able to chart this out, if you are able to do this activity actually with beneficiaries, friends and advisors periodically, I think you will find yourself having a fairly honest evaluation about where you, where you are on the basis of which you can craft your North Star framework. Coming to learning, you know, because for us to be able to achieve a lot of those outcomes will require significant amount of upskilling and reskilling. So the concept of skills and competencies becomes very important. So there are many ways to define this, right? So to keep it rather simple, what I have identified here are four key competencies that we have as individuals. So one is technical, the other is functional, which directly relates to our body of work. The third is interpersonal, which is largely about the quality and nature of our interaction with others. And then there is domain, which talks specifically about a particular industry or a subgroup within which you operate and you would like to become or build expertise in over a period of time. So when you identify your learning gaps, you, you have to think about three aspects. You have to think about knowledge, which is can I at the when I when I understand this. Can I remember it? Can I articulate it? Can I explain it to someone? Then there is the skill, which is, can I now apply this in practice? Or is this a concept that has stayed within the realm of my mind, but I have not found a way to channel that into practical application? And the third is ability. And when it comes to ability, the question is, which of these four levels do you find yourself on? For every brand new to you, you will obviously start at a novice level, but you will slowly incrementally work your way towards becoming a master. The three step learning plan that I recommend for everyone who is looking to acquire a new knowledge and skill is assimilate, transfer, and reinforce. Assimilation is largely where we talk about gathering knowledge. Expose yourself to a multitude of e learning courses, videos, blogs, white papers attend webinars, consume virtual classroom sessions, listen to informative podcasts, read up on ebooks and other uh, information. And when you think about how do you want to measure yourself, because I did mention that measurement is a key aspect of identifying your success. Give you a target in terms of the number of hours of learning that you'd like to invest and the number of artifacts that you'd like to consume. And take a first step towards identifying those key performance indicators which you will use to measure yourself once you are actually able to apply the knowledge that you have assimilated. So therefore, the next step becomes transferring that knowledge. First, in a simulated environment or a role play environment, where you're in, within a safe space, you get feedback from mentors and experts on what you did well, what you could do better. Then actually being able to facilitate that for others so that you can see how your knowledge is transferring into uh, a piece of information that can be articulated and conveyed to someone else. And finally, taking on new projects and initiatives that give you the ability to actually practically apply that skill. Otherwise, the knowledge stays silo. So measure yourself on your progress against those key performance indicators that you define for yourself in the assimilation stage and seek feedback. Seek feedback from your collaborators who worked alongside you your mentors who, who, who provided you with guidance and support, as well as the people, the stakeholders who finally benefited from your body of work. Do seek feedback from them. And look, reinforce that knowledge and skill by expanding your roles and responsibilities over time. Share your thought process, uh, leadership with others. Look to evangelize what you learn. And seek external validation through certification and credentials so that you become more easily recognized in the market. 
So now that we are at the tail end of the presentation, I'd like to take a moment to bring it all together for us in terms of what we learned. So we talked about recognizing where we are in our motivational journey and how we can use that as a stepping stone to identify and find our own intersection of all our inhabited spaces, which, which I called as, which was called as Ikigai. From there, we talked about how we can a personal mission and vision for ourselves and then articulate that very clearly on a piece of paper using the North Star framework. When we have a doubt about do we, do we have an assessment of ourselves, let's take a moment to diligently perform a SWOT analysis. Finally, when all the pieces of the puzzle are laid out in the greatest level of detail, let's take the time to create and execute a strong learning plan across the broad set of competencies, but focused on an incremental time period basis on specific knowledge, skills, and abilities so that we ultimately go from being a follower to being a leader. I'd conclude by saying that the horizon ahead of us is unlimited as always. So it's important that we don't lose sight of the boundless horizon in front of us and that we don't develop a sense of tunnel vision. Uh, the American pro football athlete, Kurt Warren, I think, at the time of being inducted into the Hall of Fame, articulated it best. The great ones have the ability to tune everything else out and see more than the others. Average quarterbacks have tunnel vision. They see what's in front of them. The better you get, the more that tunnel expands, and the more guys on the field you see. I couldn't agree with him more. With that, I'd like to thank all of you for the time you have spent with me. I hope uh, some of the thoughts resonated with you and that you could look to apply them in your own field of influence. And I hope you all stay safe and stay well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for that insightful uh, session, Sandeep. Uh, we have a few questions, uh, so probably uh, we shall go over them one by one. Um, like we would read it out for you and you can uh, share your thoughts on the same. Uh, so the first question is, um, uh, how do I handle irritation in work? Question. I think when, and it's one that I think can happen to many of us. I think the the, the worst thing that you can do at the point of irritation is to have an immediate reaction. And this unfortunately is the most natural response. So what I encourage uh, you to do or anyone who's, who's, being, who's feeling irritated, and believe me, this comes from several hours spent responding the wrong way, which ultimately leads you to believe that, yes, this is perhaps not the best way you should be responding to the situation is that just step back for a moment and understand what it is about that moment that actually irritated you. Is it a particular individual? Is it a particular, uh, is it a particular scenario or a process that bottlenecks something that led to that irritation? What is it? Usually if it is a particular person, the best way to step back is to recognize that it is possible for people to have uh, different perspectives and it is therefore never required or necessary for uh, perspectives to be enforced upon each other uh, a source of mutual and healthy disagreement is a perfectly viable place to be so it's very important is especially if the source of irritation is a particular individual is to step back from that conversation and and not look at the person as a uh, from a personal standpoint as a source of irritation but more about the the aspect of what that person is articulating and specifically then focus on that aspect rather than the person itself. I think that certainly helps. Uh, thank you, Sandeep, for that uh, answer. Uh, so the next question is on um, how to be uh, productive post uh, COVID. I hope that, um, you know, here's a very interesting thing, right? Many organizations have actually claimed that uh, 
and I, and I can understand that this may not be the circumstance for everyone. Perhaps that's the case with uh, the person who's posted the question. But but I did want to share with you that many organizations have also recognized that there's actually improved productivity as a result of COVID. That you know you're actually able to spend more time focusing on the task at hand. Uh, you're less distracted by uh, so, you know some some of the things that happen at typically at your workplace when you're on the floor. But I can also understand that many people may not have that ability, that they may actually be finding themselves limited uh, post uh, during this time. I would say that instead of us focusing on being productive post COVID, embracing how we can be productive in our current time. Um, there are certainly helpful things you can do if you find yourself very easily distracted by things. It's good to, one practice that I can share with you that I found very useful is that I block off times on my calendar when I am not available for something. So just as I, as we tend to put times on our calendar for meetings that we want to conduct, it's also helpful to block out me time. When you are focused either on the work that you want to accomplish by yourself, not necessarily having interactions with many people, or you're focused on a wellness activity for yourself. It could be as simple as spending some time on meditation or going out for a brief walk in, in your uh, neighborhood. So whatever be the case, I think it's important that you find carve time out. If it's on your calendar, I think you will respect it a lot more. So I think that's definitely one practice that helps you become more productive. You, the, the absence of productivity is basically the absence of being able to find time to do what you plan to do. So the important thing is to carve that time. Uh, thank you, Sam, uh, Sangdeep. So as, as you are just like speaking, so there's another uh, question. I thought it would be a, a good follow-up question for the previous one. So it says that how to stop being lazy. <laughs> it, uh, procrastinate can be the end of us all. You know, I, I don't think it's. Uh, I think let's recognize that you know it's complex. Is, is it possible for us to be hundred percent productive all the time? Certainly not. I would be one of the first people to articulate that it is not possible to be one hundred product, percent productive all the time. That doesn't happen. I think uh, the laziness comes from typically the absence of a defined goal or milestone. So if you give yourself goals and make them incremental goals, not just goals which are one year from now, or forget one year, even if you say uh, one week from now, because if you give yourself a goal that's one week from now, chances are you won't work on that until the last day, right? So I would say that give yourself more incremental uh, that you need to work on and objectives that you need to achieve. And it's good to actually make someone else a party to your objective. Make the commitment to someone else that you will do something so that that by itself creates a sense of urgency for you so that you're actually focused on doing it. So I think that's one way in which you can certainly overcome it. But but I, I would say that please do recognize that uh, it is possible. It is possible to feel lazy and it is not, it's not a wrong or a negative thing to happen. It's just a recognition of the fact that your body also needs time to just unwind and uh, de-stress. So do, do take the moment to do that. But as soon as you're past that, give yourself tangible objectives incrementally to work towards. Thank you for sharing that thought, Sandeep. And uh, there is much of a, a personal question on, on the similar lines, uh, which, which says that um, what kind of med meditation do you practice? I wish I could um, say, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm certainly no uh, guru by myself, uh, but technology helps us at such times, right? Not um, not all of us have, at least right now, especially have the ability to go and uh, spend time in particular uh, meditation classes and so on. But one technology driven solution that I have found very useful are, in fact, solutions. I encourage those who haven't checked these apps out, please uh, do check them out. They're called Calm and they're called Headspace. So Calm and Headspace, I find, are some really useful uh, apps where you have, uh, you know, interesting meditation techniques and uh, uh, ways to unwind and de-stress and relax your mind. I certainly have found them very helpful. Thank you, Sandeep. So moving uh, from <clears throat> from the meditation and um, getting proactive. So the questions are. Uh, 
um, now are around um, so the new ideas and projects. So there is one question which asks that how can we change our mindset on a on a start um, startup idea or new ideas for a project? Changing our mindset on a startup idea. I think if the talk is about if the question is specifically about the incubation of the idea itself, I think we'll just take us a moment back that place where we talked about charting out our mission and a vision. If you have clarity on what it is you're trying to achieve, who you're trying to achieve it for, and what you intend to get out of it, I think you find that the underlying pieces become a lot easier to define. You will recognize which skill sets you have, which skill sets are with others, where do you need support. So having a strongly defined personal mission, or in this case, we are doing a startup, which means we are doing with a group of people. We must certainly all, you know, take the time to really sit down. I, I would say one of the worst things you could probably end up doing is if you have good friends and you decide to embark on a startup together. Often, I think the best friends are the worst partners when it comes to taking on mutual, uh, mutually beneficial enterprises, especially when it comes to business. So to ensure that you do not find yourself at uh, tough crossroads later down the road, it's perhaps good to have a very honest and transparent conversation with each other about what your mutual goals are. Because only when there is a commonality between the mutual goals is there a partnership that can sustain and uh, you know realize its vision for the future. So, so having that very strongly drafted mission and vision statement is a, is a very important tool to being able to take the first step to making your idea worth something. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for sharing the thoughts on that, Sandeep. So the next question goes like this. Everyone wants to be ahead in the rat race, but how can motivation in terms of getting into success row be uh, less stressful? Uh, would I just uh, repeating that question, Sure. So it says that everyone wants to be ahead in the rat race, but how can we? Uh, how can motivation in terms of getting into uh, the success row be less stressful? That's a great question. I, I can tell you from personal experience how I have found that. Uh, uh, actually, a very very tough scenario. Uh, what happens is when we look at being ahead in the rat race, the the fundamental mistake we are making is that we're taking a very individual perspective. We're not really helping others grow with us. And that's a challenge because if you are working as a part of a team, it's often the case. Rarely, I think, are we finding ourselves in situations where we are working entirely by ourselves. We're all working as a part of a team. If you have a particularly strong ambition and you find yourself um, even, you would say, hindered to some extent, right? By by what you perceive as the lack of shared ambition. The challenge in that scenario is not really with the team. It's with you recognizing, not recognizing the fact that you have to be in it with the others. You have to take others on the road with you. So, so it was very hard at one point in my career to actually be that source of inspiration. So I learned through mistakes. I learned through constructive feedback that the only way you will actually find a sustainable path forward, one that does not stress you out to the core, is when you have others on that path with you. It means that you're all sharing the burden of the journey together, that you're all invested in each other's success. This is very, very important. It, it shows a great degree of selflessness. If, if you show yourself as a selfless individual, I think you would often find that people react very positively to selfless folks. You know, so, so I think it's very important that you, that, you, that you have a shared vision, a shared journey. When you work with your peers and colleagues, your mentors, managers, ensure that there's always that investment in that shared vision so that you only focus on how that shared vision can actually help you achieve success. If it's only for your own individual pursuit, you may find yourself hitting tough barriers especially in your interactions with others that may therefore then start bringing those negative emotions into the picture. 
Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, so the next question is on. Um, okay, how do you handle gender bias, which acts as a hindrance to your vision? This is a really, really pertinent question in today's days and time. I can tell you that uh, every organization is is making a very conscious effort to ensure that it it really stands and represents diversity. And I think I cannot even fathom, you know, the level of historic bias that we have had from a gender perspective. From many other perspectives, you know, we, we certainly are talking specifically about gender in this question. The best way to insulate yourself or to at least mitigate the uh, you know gender biases do not even consider gender as a uh, part of your i mean there are two aspects to this let me first start by saying that when it comes to what you want to see achieved eliminate gender from because i think anybody regardless of gender has the capability and ability to achieve whatever you set out to do so usually the kind of things we do at work there is absolutely no reason why any one gender can do it and another cannot. So let's just eliminate that completely. The picture. I, I remember one uh, friend of mine who used to be an ex colleague and now has his own uh, uh, social uh, startup. He actually, this is where I start saying that you have to also recognize the um, some of the aspects that are, of course, unique to gender, right? So, for example, when we talk about uh, parenting leave, we talk about maternal leave. We talk about uh, uh, you know this particular startup. I think it's a very sensitive topic, so I hope uh, you will not take offense to this. But but this friend of mine for his startup, he started offering uh, menstrual leave, right? So where we recognize that some of these things can actually be very very tough for people, and to recognize that this can be challenging, that this could be a period of time where you perhaps are not at your best. To give you the leave, to be able to take the time off, to be able to manage that, and then come back and be your best. There's both. There's aspects certainly where you must recognize that there's equality at play by ensuring that you have a level playing field, equal body work, but then also recognizing that there are sensitive periods that are of course specific to a particular gender, in which case you must recognize that there's a reason why. Those kind of leaves like maternity leave, etc., are in place. Recognizing it's a challenge. I've seen my wife, you know, uh, and how we are both trying to play a role in parenting, as as Puneet said at the beginning of the call. We have a two year old son. It is incredibly challenging. It is incredibly challenging. I think in the first six months, as much as I tried doing whatever I did, I always felt like, man, I can't believe the amount of effort and, uh, you know, pain that my wife is taking over here. And that I think increases your respect for for you know for, for womankind several several fold. So I think it's it's very important to to focus on the fact that you must have equality in your work and recognizing that there are times of sensitivity. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, so we have one last question, and then like we would be wrapping up the session for today. Uh, so this one is a quite generic, uh, which uh, which goes like this. So okay, so it says that I want to move high and get more salary in my job. What are the things that I need to do and focus on? Yeah, I encourage um, uh, post. I mean, I think it's a very important thing. I'm not. Uh, I I think it's very perverse of us to say that you know it is wrong to focus on money. I think as we saw in the Ikigai diagram, wealth is definitely a, an important part of you know defining who we are. If you find yourself at a in a situation where you think that you are not being compensated as much as you would like to be, I think it's important to make yourself more and more invaluable, which comes with increased knowledge and skills. Uh, there is enough collateral out there on the internet today which talks about what are the trending skills uh, that are required in the in the field or in the industry today. What kind of roles are seeing a huge skills shortage, and the opportunities to learn are many. You know, you have online learning platforms, plethora of them, from Simply Learns and Unacademies and the plural sites 
of the world and Coursera. So there's no shortage of learning resources, I think, today. Certainly requires a bit of investment of time and some degree of money from your side to some of these platforms. There are many free ones too, no doubt about it. But it's important that you give yourself that journey. So I think if you can take the concept of the North Star framework and tell yourself that this is where I want to be two years from now. The money aspect is one of that, that qualifies that you have reached where you want to be. But qualify that more with what exactly will you be doing to earn that money? So when you think about what is it that you will be doing, I think you will find that there is going to be an increase in the scope of what you are doing vis-a-vis -vis what you are doing today. So going back to our framework, recognize what that would look like so that you can then chart your learning journey from there. The increased knowledge, skills, believe me, if you are at a point in your ability scale where you are higher up, you know, at least you are somewhere at the practitioner, expert and master, then there is no reason why, you know, you will not be fairly compensated. So I'm sure that that's the way forward. Thank you, San, uh, Sangreep, so, uh, for sharing all your thoughts on, on uh, the questions that our participants had asked. So with this, we would be uh, wrapping up the Q&A session, and um, I would now request uh, Purit sir uh, to propose the vote of thanks for this session. Purit sir? Yeah, thank you, Chengappa. Thank you very much for uh, taking care of the session and moderating the questions. And uh, I can see a lot of participation as well as a lot of uh, relevant questions also being asked that shows that how interactive this webinar was and uh, thank you sankdeep for providing your perspective on a very very timely topic and uh, i can see you have uh, provided a totally different perspective uh, things so that way it was uh, really good and uh, i hope it was beneficial for all the members who have attended this and we look forward for more session from Walmart, actually, we have already requested uh, uh, Tathagat Verma sir to come and uh, deliver a talk uh, on some other topic. So I think he has suggested your name and uh, he was uh, uh, very confident that you are going to do a wonderful um, job by yourself. And uh, I can thank him also because he, on behalf of his suggestion, only we reached out to you and we got uh, uh connection with you and then uh, we could have this wonderful very webinar so thank you thank you tathagat verma sir and the walmart india team and we hope that in future we will be collaborating at much higher level thank you one and all uh sandeep uh, uh, any closing remarks from your side I think. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. No, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying that nothing much. I would just reiterate that stay well, stay stay safe, stay productive, and uh, stay empathetic. Keep an ear out for everyone around you, and lend a patient ear. This there has never been a more important time. True. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sangdeep. Uh, and Puneet, sir, I think we also have uh, Tagat Verma, sir, with us. Uh, so uh, I heard like, um, hello, I think we lost Puneet. So anyway, uh, uh, Tagat Verma, sir, we would be uh, in constant touch with you for the next steps and uh, 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 look forward in engaging IEEE Bangalore section with Walmart. So thanks again. Thanks, everyone, for joining today's session. And thank you, Sangdeep. Have a great.